Um, thank you very much for uh, for joining us. Um, it was a, a really interesting, but very again, just to note your point on interconnectedness, very interconnected talk. Um, and there's a number of things I wanted to ask the panels just to talk about before I open up to the floor. Um, so the reason why we kind of pulled this this panel kind of together, in particular, why we were so intrigued by this at the end of the last festival was. The way the language and the things and the structures that we default to when we don't know how to name or to understand something and it usually means that we in the case of last year's festival we default to the, the use of magical language or magical analogy to think about these things and actually one of the things that we struggle with particularly around sort of fakes and deep fakes and truths is the fact that the actual naming of realness or truth or fake or trying to find the languages that we use in order to be able to figure out um, how to even describe or even to start thinking about what these things might uh, kind of the shape of them might be um, and I kind of wanted the panelists just to comment slightly on that on that problem of language and the problem um, that they find their own work in either being able to describe it or to be able to understand it themselves and where there have been those sort of more kind of those fractures of understanding. I was just going to say that when it comes to this kind of language, I think I find it difficult in my work because it's so easy for um, them to be latched on by certain communities and then it suddenly becomes a buzzword that becomes trendy and then kind of loses um, the build up, not the build up, but it loses like motion of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Um, well, like I started out my talk, it's, uh, it, it is a great problem because you can't really even agree anymore on what is meant when someone talks about real or fake. Um, <laughs> which makes it... it uh, I appreciate sort of asking this question means that I'm putting a lot of you on the spot, but I'm, I think I'm, I'm quite keen to see the thinking around. Well, like where I've gone with this is um, because you have to uh, uh, spike your two axis thing out in so many ways, um, it, it kind of just becomes irrelevant and not to be like a, a Luddite back to the land type person, but uh, like also our community tends to get stuck in discussions about what is this and what is that while uh, all of us are sitting on chairs and we have shoes on and we'll walk out the door when we're done. You know, there is also a certain groundedness of the things that are actually happening and um, while it's a problem to have to agree on what certain kinds of those terms mean, um, what I've found interesting in the stuff that I do is uh, explaining the structure of how the stories behind it works does a lot to um, kind of mitigate that because uh, story structures are generally the same across cultures, like using metaphor or parable, you can get a long way to at least having people have a mutual understanding of what is happening uh, which can bring them together into like having some level of agreement on the terms. Um, I mean, Anna and Luba, I know that you guys work obviously a lot and you understand a lot around sort of general, um, sort of these adversarial networks that you work with. And also the language around that is it does really probe those problems because they only really see it when it starts breaking. And I wondered if that's helped be part of the language of it. Yeah. I'm not sure. So, oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, because so I'm actually really interested in the language question, and because um, there's a theory by Lakoff and Johnson about metaphors we live by, and that the that the way that you talk about the world doesn't just kind of it's not just communication, but it structures how you then kind of like think and act. And so by kind of like thinking about AI or machine learning or real and fake and kind of the kind of like metaphors that we're starting to use with it is already around this kind of like language of real or fake. We're already baking in those ideas when we start to kind of like consider it as a technology, which then kind of, you know, has the potential to kind of like lock out a different way of seeing it. And the other way that I think kind of comes in to kind of like thinking about certainly kind of like machine learning and artificial intelligence is even kind of like GANs, generative adversarial networks, that all kind of starts to lead in. And there's this, again, this kind of like 
in the language that is being used to kind of talk about it as a thing, you've already got this adversarial kind of like, you know, us be them rather than kind of thinking about it in a, in a more collaborative way. And it's one of the things that I kind of like think about with my work, which I didn't show um, this time, but it's how you can kind of start to think about kind of like more using it in a way to kind of like um, to, to, to almost collaborate. So I do lots of work where I create data sets by drawing and then kind of like feed them into a neural net, which then produce something which I then redraw. And again, so then that you kind of get these kind of like things around what's real and what's fa what's not. But yeah, no, I think the language question is really important. Yeah, and I'm just kind of looking at how nowadays we have the words of, uh, yeah, the real and the fake without so much regard as to the gradient between them. Because I think a lot of our experiences or the images and the text we see are somewhere on, on this gradient. Mm. And uh, probably should be more attention kind of paid to that versus to classifying something into either real or fake. Yeah, and it's, it's a good, it's a good um, proposition because I guess it's, it's easy for us to be binary about these things because it's often easy to deal with rather than start to think about the fact that actually these binary oppositions aren't helpful anymore and they start to break down. And I guess the next question I want to ask the panel before I open to the floor is, is going back to the idea of the uncanny valley and, and being able to understand how we reach a point or is there different points that have happened where we are st it's, we're actually seeing an inability to tell what's real and what's not. I mean, the, the example that I bring is not just the um, things like the Obama synthesized um, speeches by University of Washington, but things like um, renders of predator drones being used in real f news footage and various things that actually, even though with the right knowledge and the right skill and the right kind of analysis, you could probably tell that it's fake, that, but most people don't, kind of aren't party to that knowledge. It's something that they see and is contextualized and recontextualized and removed. Um, and, I, and I wonder kind of what you guys think about that sort of, one, is it important? That, what, what, what do we need to use to be able to figure out when things stop being easy to discern? And do, or even do you even think that is there going to be a point that we ever reach? Do you think we'll come out the other side of the, the uncanny valley as Chef talks about? Um, or will we always be able to tell at some level that things aren't real? Well, I think people are often sometimes confused, you know, what is uh, real and uh, what is fake. And uh, certainly I come from, well, or, or I grew up in Russia and that was a country where you just did not really trust the media. So you always had kind of some inbuilt uh, critical thinking as to what is shown on screen is, has most probably been fabricated to some extent, either in terms of storyline or in terms of footage, that's kind of um, natural. So. Um, I would kind of hope that uh, people continue exercising the critical thinking skills because I think as this technology advances, it uh, will become better and better. And yeah, to some people, it can look really real. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because I, I was on a panel quite recently with a, a Hung Hungarian philosopher who used to be a journalist back in the sort of Soviet um, age, and he's mentioned that if you got to know the journalists well enough, you could tell the messages that they were trying to tell you based on the, 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 the language they were using. You kind of had to take out all the superfluous, like, yes, our dear leader, and then you'd notice, like, what they were trying to tell you. Um, so, yeah, so I would be hearing more yeah, comments. That, that's, that's amazing. It brings more extra stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, the... Uh, um, um, exactly like you say, like there's always been this kind of distrust of the image in certain circumstances, which is um, kind of why uh, the, the motives of the narrative are important to the way that I see it. Like if people have the faculty to understand um, what the point of view is of a narrator in a story and how a story works, then they're also better to, uh, able to understand when they're being told a fabricated story. And then it doesn't matter as much uh, whether or not the image is real, but if they understand the mechanics of the messaging behind it, they can have a better conception of, okay, what are, what is, who is trying to tell me what and why? Mm. And through that kind of have a better understanding of what's being done to them. Um, I agree, but I think the thing that we kind of, that we're not talking about 
or we, we've talked a lot about visuals, but the other thing that is also really easy to fake now with a really, really small sample is voice. Mm -hmm. Because the example that you gave of like in your presentation about like um, someone calling up from like Microsoft and mm -hmm. pretending, because now even with that short clip, someone could then clone your voice. And I think as humans, we're really, really good at kind of like recognizing errors in kind of visuals, but we're less good at recognizing errors in kind of sound and people's voices. And I think that's actually something that isn't really being talked as much about and is potentially just as problematic. Yeah, it's, it, I, I, meant, I realized as I was going through Gatwick today that they started automating a lot of the gate calls. And I had, it's the first time I really noticed it, actually, because before I was pretty sure it was just person. But you notice there's a level at which it feels uncanny, but then you start to doubt yourself and kind of go, actually, um, is this just, but you're right, because you can't see the, the artifact as, as well, as you mentioned in your talk. But. Yeah, I mean, it's a hugely complex <laughs> issue um, that I feel like as practitioners and designers, we all have these ideas of how it could be solved, but there's nothing, I haven't come across anything that feels completely absolute. Yeah, there isn't. That's, that's, that's uh, a thing that I missed in my talk because I saw the two minute <laughs> sign and I was like, oh no. Um, but I would have liked to have said, like, uh, I definitely don't want to be there on stage and none of us should be trying to say that we have any kind of solution because um, there's, there's the old Gibson quote of the street finding its own uses for things to trot that one out again and it's all, there's always going to be people coming up with new weird ways to do everything which on the one hand is great and on the other hand can be dangerous and abusive so yeah on that note I'm going to open it up to the floor do we have any questions for our panelists didn't mean to put a really overwhelming spotlight on you. It's like, you are the chosen one. Any questions at all? Wow. OK, in that case, um, I'm going to ask another question and hopefully give you a bit of time to think about Oh, Tobias. <laughs> Thanks, Tobias. <laughs> Ah, uh, plant in the audience. Um, yeah, I was, it was interesting. So obviously, this is um, we took this event yesterday to uh, Osnabrück, and so we sort of moved on a little bit. And luckily, no one screamed about God yet over the uh, <laughs> over the audience. But yet, you know, I, what I what I found what I find interesting is, of course, as artists or people experimenting in this uh, and using these technologies, um, you know, we and you are using technologies that have a history that's deeply tied to, as Chef identified, the military industrial surveillance complex. That's primarily what these systems are developed for. They're for making predictive decisions about policing, for targeting advertising. We've seen the, the various inquiries and so on and so forth into Cambridge Analytica, which tell us, show us, reveal to us somewhat these systems. Are there strategies that artists, curators, practitioners can adapt, uh, sorry, adopt, that they can use to, um, to, to, to bring that critical awareness to a public? Because we say, you know, it's really easy for us to think critically about the media we consume, mm. but most people in the world have other concerns. They're not mm. questioning everything around them all the time. Are there definitive aesthetic strategies or, or technical strategies that can be used in order to get people to think more about the histories of these things and the way they're constructed? You just say no. It's Me. <laughs> Good question, Tobias. Um, this, uh, this might seem like a really silly idea, but maybe it's about forcing people to read more before they, before they like, when I'm thinking about when um, I'm creating something that, for example, exists on a website and it is, is set up where there's um, like a reward system the same way a video game would be set up. Maybe it's something that they have to read or have an understanding of before they can move on to the next step. Um, because I know it's not as simple as finding a way for people to read the small print. Um, in my MA dissertation, I looked at the problems with smart devices within the home and how that can challenge feelings of privacy. And I had one case study, which was an LG smart TV that had voice activation. And people were devastated that it was recording every conversation in their household. But I think from a, from a perspective of the kind of work that we exist within, I was like, how else would it work, you know? <laughs> was that also 
Was, was that the TV that when people said, like, don't listen to us always in the living rooms, they started including it in some of the documentation? Yes. Like, don't have private conversations yeah. in front of the television? Yeah. Yeah. Which, <laughs> as a solution, is, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, from my perspective, it's important to address these uh, topics related to the uses and implications of technology from a balanced perspective. And uh, often when I look at museum shows that are doing something with AI, they're always very dystopian. It's always about surveillance, privacy, and problems with facial recognition. And as a technical optimist, I am bored because it's always the same repetitive message. And I just yearn for the times when we show more artists who use some of these technologies for um, to, to develop new modes of representation and to explore further creative potential. So I think to kind of convince or to, I don't know, to uh, show your message more to people like me, it's important to offer a balanced perspective, so to include more shows where um, where you show how artists are using this technology in a positive sense, or also some of the positive applications of this technology in uh, medical sciences and, and so on. And then also include some of the more uh, troubling or problematic examples. And for me, I suppose it goes back to what I said in my talk, that I think using kind of like the technology that I'm using, it needs to be split between the data sets and the algorithm. And the algorithm might have, well, it, it has grown from kind of like military, military background. And, but also kind of like algorithms are now easy to get. Um, you know, you can go on GitHub or you can go online and find lots and lots of kind of like very effective machine learning algorithms. So, and it's quite, and it's easy to kind of, kind of then kind of build your own or, or tweak it or, or play with it. For me, the bigger problem and the more troubling thing is data. And that has come out with things like Cambridge and Analytica and Palantir and things like that. And the way that there isn't a lot of data that is available to use with this machine learning algorithm unless you own it yourself. And so that's kind of like, that's, you know, by making my own data sets and kind of like talking about it a lot, that's something, that's the strategy that I'm using to kind of like bring it out in my practice. But yeah, I think the data sets is a real problem. And it, because whatever you put into the algorithm, the algorithm is essentially stupid. But the data sets and the choices and decisions of what you include and what you don't include, that's what's important. And that's where I think a lot of the conversation needs to go. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective, actually, kind of especially with artists who are working with AI, that you are only really using the structures that are given to you a lot of the time, unless you have the extreme sort of technology to be able to build them up your own. And so I wanted to ask about your data set, because I, I think I've, I've seen that you, you creating your own involves you taking lots of pictures of tulips, is that yeah. right? Yeah, so by creating my own data set for this project, I'm taking over 20,000 pictures of tulips, which <laughs> is driving me crazy. But, um, cause other, but it's, like, it's very, very different from, and you have very, it's, and I liked what you were talking about, Lucy, about the kind of like cro digital craftsmanship, because you do get that sense of kind of like, of, of when you're taking them, rather than just kind of like stripping them all from Google or using something that has kind of, because when you're using something that when you're just typing in Google, into Google tulips, then you're just taking the top rank results and you're not kind of like, you're just relying on other people or the kind of like the algorithm that sits there to then give you that result. Um, and even if you're using the, the very canonical um, databases that are used by a lot of machine learning kind of like algorithms like ImageNet or WordNet. So my, fav my two favorites, so if you go and look up the word beauty, and this is one of the databases that is used to run so many tests and eventually like makes its way into like so many different kind of like machine learning things that work on your phone and stuff. Um, you look up beauty and it's the only images are kind of like white, female, young, sexualized. Um, and you look at the kind of like subdivisions and it's all kind of like harlot, coquette, or like harridan. So there's no, like women are ca categorized in either like super sexual or kind of like monstrous ol older woman. And if you look at the word monstrous as well, it's pictures of Frankenstein, but it's also pictures of people who are disabled. So, and that's just because someone's tagged it as that, and then that's made its way in, and unless someone looks at that and kind of decides no, it just sits there in this database. 
And so that's kind of like some of the, the things that I think. I mean, mm, I think the general condition of that. Mm, um, but it is that sense of unease around. And I think that's where there are artists who are starting to actually, as well as using the tools to create their own work, start to analyse the tools that they use and understand the politics or the workings of them. And I know that also, you, in some ways, all of you have done that and the artists that you work with. Um, because you're right, but you can only really work with what you're given. And if you only have this limited shape of things, that, that you can't get anything more than that. So. Um, any more questions from the audience at all before I have to ask Tobias again to ask a question? I know he's got like 70. Ah, uh, Ian. Yeah, I have a question actually in response to what Anna said. Um, basically, you, you say if there's a bias, it's the data set much more than the algorithm. The algorithm is stupid. I wonder how the other people on the panel see this. If the algorithm cannot be biased, it's simply stupid, and it's the data set. Do the other people agree with that? Yeah, so I would probably um, agree with uh, with Anna, and uh, I think recently uh, the the journalists and uh, the, the mass public have been putting excessive blame on the algorithm in this case. And if we think about what the algorithms have been trained on, it's kind of the images we've been putting up online. It's kind of maybe of what our society was like in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s, when it was kind of less diverse, more unequal. And uh, yes, yeah, so the algorithm these days still often learn from uh, those kind of images or texts. And uh, there are certain visions or changes that we want to uh, make of our society that are not currently kind of in this data. So I know there are some artists, uh, such as I think Mimi Anuoha and uh, Caroline Sanders, who are working on uh, adding kind of more data sets that are feminist or that incorporate more kind of people from various backgrounds. So yeah, I would place kind of more blame on the data. Though saying that, a lot of the algorithms that are currently being developed, uh, they are mainly developed by white men. So I, I would often go to these uh, machine learning conferences that are yeah, leading in the field and they'd attract 10,000 uh, people and they would be 10% women. So yeah. Um, I would say that I kind of see the algorithm as a simple equation. It's kind of like E equals MC squared. And then the data set is almost, um, you know, what kind of makes us human in terms of nurturing. It's giving you, with those 20,000 images of tulips, it's giving you all, all those structured memories of what a tulip would be. So I feel like without it, there's almost nothing there. Yeah, I, w I would add that while, yes, the algorithm itself is stupid, it's a set of instructions that it's following, uh, the instruct it was instructed. The, it's the, an accumulation of choices made by people, and it contains variables. There are weightings for decisions that are made. Some things are made more and less important, and that speaks to your point where then it starts mattering who made those decisions and who constructed it. Um, but yeah, there is ways that the algorithm itself skews, but when it's running, it's, it's just following instructions. So in that sense, yeah, it's stupid. And it seems to me that point about the algorithm itself, again, is done, but the application of it and the choice to apply it and in what context and in what structure, that's when it kind of releases that, that, um, that neutrality. And again, I don't think any, there's any, anything such as neutrality with any of these systems, personally. I don't know if the panelists agree with that, but I don't know. Any more questions? We've got five more minutes. I've got to be one more question from someone that's not Ian or Tobias who are involved, who are involved with Impact Festival. Anyone not an employee of Impact Festival <laughs> and have a question? There are no stupid questions, obviously. Ah, in the back. Ah, you're up. Hi. So, um, after imagery and after audio, so what will be the next medium or uh, thing that we can... Uh, uh, use AI on, which is not possible today. Oh. Get some time to think. Um, good, funny, you should ask. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm currently working on a project where we're researching how uh, autonomous agents could be deployed um, with 
uh, non-humans and ecosystems to, walk to work towards regenerative ecologies. So this is an area where something could be done. Um, we don't really know where that's going yet because we've only just started the field work. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could apply this stuff anywhere at a certain point. It doesn't have to be text and images if you figure out some way in which to give it agency. And that's kind of, of course, also where it just in terms of the available technology kind of gets stuck now because there's only so much you can do, I mean. There's companies that say they're going to reforest the desert with drones and whatnot, how technically feasible that is, I'm not sure. Um, but weird speculative research is being done in this area. That, that's as much as I can say about a it. A clearer example. A clearer um, example of? of? Of that ecology, the kind of generative ecology approach. Regenerative. Yeah. Well, um, our research is trying to think about um, like large areas of the earth need to be regenerated, reforested, have life restored to them in some way. Uh, we as humans have been the elements that kind of destroyed it in the first place. Mm. If we can create autonomous agents and if we respect the autonomy of ecosystems and non-human agents, as in animals, etc., uh, why don't we just let them hang out together and figure it out and take humans out of the equation altogether and see what happens? Um, Fake this, forests. This is what we're currently throwing a bunch of AI artists and ecologists at and uh, seeing what happens. Anyone else? Yeah, so, yeah, as you mentioned, there have been various advances in uh, vision and kind of sound, and in terms of uh, the future or other current applications that we hadn't really mentioned, I think it really kind of depends on how you kind of quantify or turn into data whatever you're uh, looking to do, right? Because uh, it's possible to... Um, yeah, to quantify smell, movement, and uh, I, I guess other uh, things or senses and kind of actions that exist in the world, and then kind of get uh, the machine learning algorithms to generate you new data, which you can then turn into a new smell or into kind of uh, a new movement. But I think uh, the problem is, is that uh, some of these are less advanced than others. So a lot of the problems in computer vision have been solved, but uh, for example, with, with text, there are kind of still a lot of issues. Um, I was just going to say this is more from um, potentially a new way to collect data, but I know this might be common knowledge to some people here, but I know that Google is looking into ways that they can take ownership uh, over gestures that could be done without you necessarily touching a screen, so using the camera or maybe using other spatial senses. Um, so that could be another way from a kind of interesting perspective of like Black Mirror and everyone having a microchip in their brain, ways of, you know, taking ownership of people's physicalities. Ecology and Black Mirror, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm waiting to see what Palantir come out with. That's my next one. As Tobias said in his last, uh, his last panel, they're the ones to watch. It, like all good fashion trends. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's been really interesting, and I'm sure there's lots of other questions people have in their brains. Um, you will have some form of contact, probably. No? Oh, I'm, am I promoting something? There we go. Um, <laughs> I've generated a, an advert. Uh, no, you should definitely come. Um, there's a number of really great events that are happening as a result in the, sort of in the lead up to Impact 2018. I can't wait to see what Luba and the team come up with. I'm very excited to come here. Um, Ian's going to say something. Because Mimi Onuwa was mentioned, um, yes. we'll have her as a guest on May 18, and May 19, Luba will be again here with her presentation with the fellow curators. And that's not on the slide, so on I want to add that. That's right, you can, it's on the Impact website. So no, yeah. yeah, so if, okay. you're, if you're interested in the issues of AI and bias and fairness, then you should come to our event on the 19th of, of May, when we will have uh, Joanna Bryson, the artist uh, Helen Knowles, and um, a researcher from uh, Rotterdam, Mike... Uh, 
oh, if I could remember Dutch names, I would tell you, but I cannot. It is on the website. Then you should, <laughs> sorry. Then, yeah, either way, you should come to this event on the 19th of May when we will further uh, discuss the themes of bias and yeah. ethics and algorithms. Yeah, you should definitely, Helen Knoll's film Super Debt Hunterbot is fantastic. She puts an algorithm on showing. trial. It's a, yeah, an algorithm on trial if you want to see what that is. Um, but yeah, can I have a round of applause for our panellists, please?